So as promised, uh, the beginning of my deep dive series on offshore wind, and no, it wasn't a clickbait title. The issues associated with financing for offshore wind actually have some relationship to solar. Let me explain. So as you may know, the Inflation Reduction Act put out a lot of tax credits for renewable energies, wind and solar. And there turns out, in my research, I didn't fully appreciate this thing called tax equity market. And in short, what that is, is big banks and creditors can specialize in a particular form of financing where the tax credits you're due are used as collateral in a sense. It's much more complicated than that. But in a sense, it's used as collateral and that allows these renewable energies that require a lot of upfront dollars to be able to go and get financing to do their project using the tax credits as collateral. Sounds great. The issue is that when a bank is having to make a decision as to where they're gonna accept the collateral from and money they're willing to give out, there's less money available to lend than there are projects that people want to fund. And as a consequence, the solar projects, which have relatively low risk of returning their money and making a profit, tend to get preference. And so does on, on land win, onshore as it's known. So when you go offshore and there are more risks, they're having a lot of trouble with their financing. So yes, it's definitely to do with interest rates. Yes, it's definitely to do with the lack of financing. So as I talked about in my New Jersey video, but I did not have a full understanding of this whole tax equity market. It's a very interesting and specialized piece of finance. So let me go into a few more details for those who want to understand more. Ironically, one of the actions that could be considered in the longer term here is how do you wean off some of the more established renewables from tax credits? Because since they are still consuming this uh, equity market, uh, when they get out, that money will become free to work on other somewhat more risky projects, which is of course what it's there for. You're not meaning to fund the less risky project. Um, I don't think that's gonna result in a near-term change to the law. It's always difficult with these things to wean yourself off and that really needs to happen uh, for solar and probably onshore wind and maybe EVs to boot. Um, I know those industries would not particularly like to hear me say that, but that's a sign of their maturity. That's a sign that their day has come and you do need to do it in a measured fashion because they've been living off of that approach of financing for some time. Just pulling it out suddenly would also have bad, bad consequences. So we know, however, historically, that is always an issue. It tends to be all one or the other, hopefully, in the 2030s, we'll do that part a little, little smarter this time. So there's another layer of financing that comes under the project. So you got the financing that you have to get for the specific wind farm you're trying to build, but these companies have to get boats. Okay, and I use the word boats or ships. It's a very specialized piece of equipment that needs to be used to uh, build offshore wind farms. And that is currently a constrained quantity in the world. And they too are not cheap. It's another piece that needs capital investment. Would love to see someone get to be the Tesla of offshore uh, wind components, but that currently doesn't exist today. So it's kind of a triple tiered issue with financing. You have the project itself, you have the issues such as the ships, and then you have just the components that go into that ship, very specialized cranes, uh, the cement that's used in underwater construction, you can imagine it's also very specialized. The vessels that have to go out and conduct surveys, uh, they are specialized. They also all need fairly specialized equipment for sonar and measuring wind. So. All of this creates a bottleneck in financing for offshore wind.